Good evening. Uh, this is Daniel Morin. Uh, I'm from the Auctioner Medical Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I'm a senior consulting editor for circulation, arrhythmia, and electrophysiology. On behalf of our editor-in-chief, Dr. Paul Wong, who's here with us tonight, I'd like to welcome you to the Atrial Fibrillation and Supraventricular Arrhythmias Advisory Board discussion for the month. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, we have the Q&A feature in the bottom of the screen. Uh, I would encourage you all to use it uh, in order to interact with our uh, panelists um, and with each other, uh, I suppose, indirectly. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to some of the leaders of our advisory board, Drs. Peter Noseworthy and Rupi Sandhu. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for having us. It's going to be a great session today. Uh, we've got a great group of panelists and a phenomenal paper to discuss. So we're looking forward to it. Um, Dr. Sandhu will do some introductions and then we'll hand it over to our uh, uh, presenter to discuss the paper. Well, hello, everybody. We're so delighted to have with us the first author of our highlighted paper, Dr. Yoshi Takahashi, who's the director in the Department of Cardiology at Shin Yurigakou General Hospital in Kawasaki, Japan. And he'll be providing us with a great overview of this study. And following his presentation, we'll have an exciting discussion on lifestyle modification on AF burden and outcomes by our distinguished panelists, which will comprise of Prash Sanders, Professor of Medicine at the University of Adelaide and the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. He's the director at the Center of the Heart Rhythm Disorders at the University of Adelaide and director of the Cardiac Electrophysiology and Pacing at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And his research is vast, as many of you may know, it spans the spectrum from investigations in the cellular electrophysiology animal models of disease to evaluate arrhythmia mechanisms. And most recently, his work has focused on the role of risk factor management on treating AF. Our second panelist will be Greg Marcus, endowed professor of atrial fibrillation research at the University of California, San Francisco, where he also serves as associate chief of cardiology for research. He oversees multiple research programs focused on lifestyle factors and arrhythmias, quality improvement in EP procedures, and helps to run the NIH-funded Eureka Digital Research Platform. And finally, we'll have Dr. Janet Hahn, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, MVA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System, where she also serves as the Associate Director of Cardiac Arrhythmia Service. She is the chair-elect of the American College of Cardiology Digital Strategy Committee, and her research focuses on arrhythmia care of the veteran population, anticoagulation in special populations, and the emerging intersection of digital health and cardiac electrophysiology. So with that, let's begin. Yoshi, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Rupi and Peter. So let me share my slide. Okay. So it's my great pleasure to be here and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'd like to give an overview of our study, which was published in uh, Circulation Arrhythmia and Electrophysiology, Electrophysiology this year. The title of this uh, today's talk is The Impact of Alcohol Consumption on Atrial Fibrillation Therapy and Outcomes, Importance of Lifestyle Modifications, COI. So now it is known that uh, risk of AFib is associated with uh, alcohol consumption. Now, so this uh, slide shows that uh, uh, risk of AFib increases with uh, alcohol consumption uh, in a dose dependent manner. Uh, according to this slide, risk of AFib becomes significant around at 10 drinks per week. So 10 drinks is a 20, 120 gram of alcohol. And the reason these two studies demonstrated alcohol consumption is also associated also with the uh, uh, clinical outcome of catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. The right, right figure shows that study included 122 patients with proximal AFib. Blue is an alcohol abstainer, and the red is uh, patients with uh, patients who are taking alcohol moderately, and the green is heavy drinkers. 
uh, alcohol upstanding had the best clinic outcome. The green is uh, heavy drinker had the worst clinic outcome. In the right figure included 1,361 patients with proximal HP, and the red is alcohol abstainer, and the blue is uh, patients who are taking alcohol. And uh, again, alcohol consumption was associated with the worst clinical outcome after a catheter ablation for AP. But in both states, patients were not requested to limit their alcohol consumption. So the question is, uh, we, uh, whether alcohol reduction in alcohol consumption is associated with improvement in clinical outcome after catheter ablation of 4 AFib. Therefore, uh, we, uh, we sought to assess atrial tachycardia free rate after AFib ablation according to alcohol reduction during follow up. Our study was a prospective mouth center observational study. Consecutive patients undergoing de novo AFib ablation were enrolled at 10 centers in Japan. Enrollment period was between November 2017 and June 2019. Ablation devices or ablation uh, strategy were determined at the, operate, at the discretion of the operators, but uh, all patients were requested to, requested to limit their alcohol consumption to 20 gram per week. So we set 20 gram because so 20 gram is uh, one unit of a Japanese sake and then beer, uh, 500 milliliter. The primary point was uh, if we, our freedom from a fever atrial tachycardia without antiarrhythmic drugs beyond three month blank, blanking period. And we compared clinic outcome between alcohol reduction group and no reduction group. 3,521 patients were enrolled, and 47% of patients did not take alcohol at baseline, but 49% of patients were uh, taking alcohol before ablation, and so these patients were included in analysis set. So we split patients into a reduction group and a no reduction group. We uh, determined 1% of cutoff because uh, 1% cut, cut off yielded the uh, minimal p-value. So uh, reduction uh, group included 1,102 patients, and no reduction group, 618 patients, and age, gender, BMI, type of age fibrillation, and comorbid comorbidities were similar between two groups. But baseline, uh, baseline alcohol consumption differed significantly between two groups. So reduction group patients uh, reduced alcohol, uh, consumed alcohol greater at baseline compared to no reduction group. Uh, and uh, some patients, uh, uh, some people ask me 1% of reduction is enough. I don't, I don't think so because the uh, reduction, median percentage of alcohol reduction in reduction group was 75%. So most of patients reduced alcohol uh, more than half, uh, more than 50%. This is the clinical outcome. So reduction group, uh, th uh, this, uh, this uh, figure included a proximal persistent of long term persistent AFP and a uh, near free rate at one year was 83% uh, in the reduction group and no reduction group 72% on multivariate analysis, hazard ratio was 0 0.63, which means uh, alcohol reduction was associated with a lower rate of uh, arrhythmia recurrence by 37%. So this association seems to, seems to differ according to baseline alcohol consumption. So in the group of uh, baseline alcohol consumption, 20 to 119 grams per week, univariate analysis has showed as statistical significance. However, multivariate analysis, a p-value did not reach uh, statistical significance and hazard ratio was 0 0.79. In the group of uh, uh, baseline alcohol consumption, 120 grams per week or more, 
on money value analysis, hazard ratio was 0.56, which was much smaller than this value. So this study published in New York Journal in the last year reported alcohol consumption reduction improved the arrhythmia free rate. In this study, 30% of patients underwent catheter ablation before study period, but ablation was not performed during the study period, and most of the patients did not undergo ablation. So some, uh, some people ask me, um, PB isolation may sure work, uh, of, should work even in patients with uh, uh, who drinks alcohol a lot. But our study suggested uh, patients should uh, patients should stop uh, re reduce alcohol alcohol before ablation and even after ablation they uh, continue uh, reduction in alcohol consumption. In conclusion. Alcohol reduction was associated with lower rate of atrial tachycardia recurrence after catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Great, thank you for that wonderful overview. We're gonna move into our discussion. I would just remind the viewers to please use their Q&A function uh, whenever they have any questions. Well, thank you very much, um, Yoshi, for that talk. I'll maybe start with a question to you, and then I'd like to hear uh, some discussion from our panelists and their take on this uh, exciting and interesting work. Um, do you have any sense of how durable the reduction in alcohol intake was over the course of the study? Um, as you often see, the lines eventually start to come together a little bit. Is, do you think that's related to people Going, you know, drinking again, or is that just the natural history of post-ablation outcomes um, sort of regressing to where they're going to be? Do you have a, a sense of that or anything you can uh, tell us about that? So uh, you mean uh, patients with reduced alcohol, uh, but uh, during a follow-up, they increase again. This is what you mean? I, w I wonder if that's the case. Did you, did you, yeah. did you do serial surveys over time? Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's a big problem. So uh, before ablation and maybe uh, within six months after ablation, they are really keen to reduce alcohol because they follow my instruction. But uh, one year, uh, two years, and then they forgot to, and then they believe that it's already cured. So it's very hard to comp explain now uh, still, uh, uh, Outside of the paranoid vein, there is a uh, arthmogenicity may grow, grow uh, with alcohol uh, uh, consumption, but uh, uh, it is a, it is problem. And if you look at the, my Kaplan major curve, it comes a bit, bit uh, uh, alcohol reduction group uh, comes com, comes down compared to the uh, control group. So mm -hmm. it catch up catch up to the. Uh, a quick outcome catch up uh, at the end of the Kaplan May curve. It's uh, around the two or three years follow up. Right. So it's a problem to continue uh, uh, this lifestyle modification, everything, the body weight, all, all, uh, alcohol, everything. Yeah, I mean, clearly there's a lot we can do with lifestyle intervention in these patients to improve outcomes, but actually getting that message across and, and changing people's behavior in a meaningful and lasting way is a challenge, I think. I wonder if Dr. Sanders, Prash, do you have uh, some comments you'd like to make on what you've found successful? Because I bet most of the people listening to this are practicing clinicians who are now trying to think, well, how do I actually get my patients to make these kinds of changes? So do you have any reflections on that you can share? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean the, this is a hugely uh, uh, brilliant study because it's a large group of patients and uh, we've seen dramatic effect with alcohol yet again to add to the data from Peter Kistler's group in the New England. Um, one, one of the striking things I think from Yoshi's comment is, and seen in Peter's study also, is that they needed to stop the study early. Uh, Peter's study was registered as a 12 month, but they gave up after six months because everyone started drinking again. Uh, and so this is a habit that's very hard to break. And, and uh, Yoshi's comment is kind of uh, heading down that direction as well, that the difference seems to be catching up as time goes on. 
one of the key things that we've found is sustainable lifestyle change needs small changes over a long period of time. And so although we can take a great large intervention, so for example, in weight loss, our first study, we actually looked at meal replacements uh, and got people to completely go on to calorie restricted shakes to lose their weight. And we had dramatic impact early. Almost no one sustains that in the long term. Whereas we've now moved to a strategy of just making small dietary changes at each visit which then becomes sustainable. And one of the keys we've found is maintaining contact with the office. So whether that is an email contact or an in-person once a year visit seems to re-trig the importance for that person to maintain the, uh, the change that they've done. And so uh, I think alcohol will be very similar. And, and in certainly in our experience, it's making small changes over time um, rather than being able to do a dramatic change up front. So it's interesting data from that point of view. That's a lot, you know, you think about trying to maintain contact with all of our post-ablation patients and what a challenge that is for, you know, even just managing antiarrhythmic drug therapy and things like that. So to put this into the mix is a challenge. And a lot of folks are thinking about using digital strategies to maintain follow-up and reminders. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to talk about um, the promise of that kind of approach or the potential pitfalls of that kind of approach or how do we put this into action in a way that's scalable? So I can dive in just yeah, a little bit. I was thinking about you, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I agree with Prash. I think it's, you know, so hard because I think alcohol, first of all, to dive back into the sort of lifestyle modification, I think alcohol is so tough because alcohol is really ingrained in our social sort of network, uh, networking and, and just being social beings in every single culture. Um, so I think it really takes, I agree with Prash that it takes small changes, but I think it really is that change in mindset that the person is going to have to be thinking differently and not just, again, making large changes and, and changing your diet by taking shakes and whatnot, because it has to be, again, a sustainable change, right? So changing the mindset of people is very, very, very difficult. So I think the social aspect, I think, makes alcohol maybe even more difficult uh, than, um, than diet and exercise. Uh, Digital-wise, I think, um, looking at that perspective, I think there's been sort of promises made, and I, I am sure you know this as well, Peter, uh, trying to use digital strategies to intervene uh, on lifestyle modification, and it always hasn't, it hasn't always been successful. So I think studies still need to be done to really say, do these things that ding at us, you know, a thousand times a day, are those things really going to remind us to be better people? I'm not sure. I, I would just add that, um, there is a still, I think, an unknown, and Dr. Takahashi can can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think that this study tells us whether the people destined for successful ablation experienced a heightened risk of subsequent AFib from drinking, or whether the difference we're seeing is really within the group that was going to fail or was more or less likely to fail anyway such that those, some of them stopped drinking or drank a lot less, so they experienced a lot less AFib. So I think that, the, you know, a common question that patients have who enjoy drinking alcohol, and of course we always want to counsel to avoid drinking in excess, but even some, you know, they ask, you know, I enjoy a glass of red wine once in a while, and the common question is, if I have an ablation, is that going to mitigate that risk? And I think that this remains an open question. If we isolate the pulmonary veins, if, if we're successful, and that particular patient is the type that, for whatever reason, that we still don't completely understand, is amenable, uh, their AFib is amenable to ablation, perhaps they then can. I, you know, I think what I tell my patients now is, look, if you want to do everything you can to minimize your chance of having another AFib episode, you should avoid alcohol. But we have to acknowledge this is it's a quality of life um, quality of life uh, issues as well. Um, and you know, Prash just uh, uh, sent something in the chat, which is, you know, we we tried to understand why does this happen. It's quite amazing, given how ubiquitous alcohol is, that we still don't completely understand what it's doing to our hearts, much less how precisely it's 
causing atrial fibrillation. So we performed a randomized trial in hopes of elucidating that and, and found that participants randomized to intravenous alcohol titrated to a, a, a blood alcohol concentration of, of 0.08% exhibited a substantial reduction in the refractory period predominantly, interestingly, in the pulmonary veins. And there did, did seem to be something about the pulmonary veins versus the, the, the rest of the atria that was important, which would uh, lead one to think that perhaps if you successfully isolate the pulmonary veins, that might provide some protection against alcohol-induced uh, AFib. Uh, just to comment on the, the issue of behavioral change, the other um, you know, finding we recently uh, published had to do with the acute relationship between alcohol and AFib. And there is evidence primarily from the smoking literature that if you can um, uh, educate people regarding fairly immediate risks, those can be much more compelling than these long-term risks. You know, smokers worrying about developing lung cancer 20 years from now, they're like, ah, you know, I, I can't even imagine that. And, and you know, humans, unfortunately, uh, uh, kind of deduce probability based on how easy it is to imagine something. Whereas telling them, you know, drinking right now will enhance your risk for AFib in the next few hours, that can help, uh, I think, with the, the behavioral change we want to uh, stimulate, <laughs> motivate. That's a really compelling uh, concept, I think, because there are no immediate, uh, there's no positive feedback to skipping the cheeseburger that day. And, you know, those, those small lifestyle, lifestyle changes take years to compound, whereas people can get immediate results, particularly if they're drinking before the ablation and they, and they have that life event that causes them to, to, to change their ways. And maybe that's reinforcing in a way, maybe we can leverage that immediate positive effects to to um, help promote the other lifestyle interventions that we want to help patients with. I think that's a, a very useful, uh, a, a very useful uh, uh, formulation. So Yoshi, can I ask you a, a couple of questions? So uh, did you have to do anything specific to make, get them to make such a dramatic lifestyle change? I mean, th this is a huge reduction that you've achieved. Um, what, what, did you, what did you say to them? Uh, thank you. So actually, we did just uh, uh, explanation from patient to pa uh, physician to patient. That's it. But uh, currently, I think it's not enough. So firstly, uh, what I did, what, what I'm doing is education in the, to nurse. So our uh, our hostel team should uh, uh, acknowledge uh, uh, harmfulness of uh, alcohol on the heart, not only liver. So in Japan, uh, liver dysfunction, uh, alcoholic liver dysfunction are uh, decreasing uh, uh, pro probably during these 20, 30 years. But uh, we did not, uh, 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 we did not know uh, negative effects of alcohol on uh, myocardial or atrial arrhythmias. So just we uh, learning now. So, uh, so that's why I'm uh, explaining not only uh, uh, patients, their family, and the nurse, and everyone. And this is one, one thing. And another thing is uh, I'm now using the alcohol uh, app uh, for mobile phone. Uh, there is a free app in, uh, available in Japan. So first, uh, now I just studied by myself and trying to uh, uh, try to train it and uh, maybe uh, next month I will uh, ask patients to use it and this is I think and uh, interestingly elder people they've uh, they are really uh, they've stopped alcohol they're very uh, voluntary uh, I mean uh, more than 70 years old uh, actually uh, median uh, alcohol consumption uh, com comparison between uh, over 70 years old and uh, less than 70, uh, there's a significant difference in our hospital. So uh, I think uh, uh, over 70 years old, they uh, spontaneously reduce alcohol consumption. So, so in 70 years old, the patients, they uh, follow my instruction. But the problem is the very young patients, 40 or 50 years old patients, 
And I think uh, these patients, uh, maybe mobile phone app will, will work for work. I will see that. Yoshi, did you, I'm sorry, uh, Raj, did you, uh, did you, uh, did you repeatedly ask them to cut down on their alcohol or was that a sort of a one-time discussion that had a very durable, uh, very durable effect? Or was that, uh, was that repeated that you asked, asked them to cut down? Yoshi. Oh, uh, so, uh, uh, actually, in that study, uh, we ask patients every time, every consultation, I ask uh, how, how, how much you take. This is a very effective, actually. So mm -hmm. if you can do the same thing in a clinical practice, I don't think uh, it will work. Very good. So along those lines, actually, uh, you know, I live here in New Orleans where uh, alcohol is basically water. Um, and so there are lots and lots of people who... <laughs> want to uh, want to drink. And when I talk with my patients about cutting down uh, on alcohol, they will oftentimes ask me uh, about an absolute number of, uh, uh, of drinks that would be okay for them to drink. Now you looked at uh, a change from baseline to later. Um, it's a big difference to go from having 20 grams of alcohol a day uh, down to fewer than that than it is to go from 120 grams of uh, alcohol a day. Um, that would be an awful lot um, to uh, to less. Um, did you look at your data uh, at the end of the at the end of your study or during your study to get an idea of what an absolute number of uh, alcoholic drinks uh, intake um, is? safe or ideal or reduces the risk for these patients? Thank you. Thank you, very uh, good question. So uh, before, when I started analysis and I thought uh, there, uh, I, will, I want to have a clear uh, cutoff of, for, for example, if patients reduce to 20 grams, they will be better clinical outcome. But uh, if they uh, continue alcohol 100 grams, they will be bad outcome, but this uh, such kind of uh, analysis uh, could, could not find a good uh, statistical significance. This is maybe because uh, if you remember my slide, the association between alcohol consumption and the clinical outcome is big, different according to the baseline alcohol consumption. So if patients are taking alcohol 500 grams per week, these patients had a very, uh, were uh, with, uh, the, this patient's AFib is greatly affected by alcohol. But if patient had only uh, alcohol uh, 100 grams per week, so this patient's AFib is not uh, less, uh, effect, uh, less affected by uh, alcohol. So maybe this patient may, should have other risk factors as well. So AFib is not only, of course, AFib, uh, uh, due to alcohol, so there's a, a lot of risk factors and we cannot uh, calculate all of these risk factors so far. So it's important, so, so this study is very important for heavy drinkers, particularly heavy drinkers. Yoshi, so, a question has come in, yeah? a question has now come in from the Q&A uh, from mm -hmm. Walter Clare asking if you were able to look at the pattern of drinking, in particular, whether people are binge drinkers or more habitual drinkers, and whether that has an effect on outcomes. I think you mentioned it actually in the, in the paper that you only had total consumption, but have you since looked at the pattern of drinking, in particular binge drinking versus daily consumption? Oh. No, we didn't have any data on binge drinking. So I don't know about it. Do, do any of the panelists want to weigh in on that, uh, the, the pattern of drinking in its relationship to atrial fibrillation? Maybe Greg, since you've done that. Sure. So interestingly, there's no, I'm going to let Prash talk about uh, a paper that recently came out of his group, uh, senior authored by Chris Wong, that, that actually uh, was somewhat very uh, novel in its observations, but I think well positioned to be that way because it's one of the largest papers to try to look at this. Um, the evidence in general, with that one exception that, again, I think is very important, is that the type of beverage doesn't seem to matter or hasn't borne out in previous studies. 
And in general, the relationship seems to be fair, fairly linear. Of course, this, this is in regards to heightened risk with more drinking rather than lower risk with cessation, meaning the more one drinks, the higher, the higher the risk. And that's been shown in multiple studies. There have been a couple that suggest that even one drink uh, may increase the risk. Renata Schnabel uh, published a paper, a large epidemiologic study to demonstrate that. In our um, kind of much smaller but densely phenotyped, continuously monitored uh, participants, just one drink heightened the risk uh, of AFib uh, in a few hours. But it is a, an extremely common question that patients ask. They want to know uh, what the threshold is. So, so I'll, let, I'll hand it over to Prash to comment on that study. Yeah. So, so I, mean, I mean, I think the paper um, Greg's referring to is uh, data from the UK Biobank. And, and I guess there's a slight difference. One is a secondary prevention, one's a primary prevention kind of issues. And so this was kind of primary prevention where it wasn't patients with atrial fibrillation as such, but rather uh, the large uh, database and interestingly, we found that there was a protective element to alcohol. Um, and there was also a difference. Wine did better than spirits, and it kind of shifted how many drinks you could have before you were at risk of having uh, atrial fibrillation. So yeah, actually, a glass of wine a day was kind of uh, OK uh, for primary prevention. But this is a secondary prevention cohort. And uh, the big question is, where should the line be drawn? And, it's, a, it's a, a, I think, a difference between uh, something that's achievable because abstinence is really difficult to convince any of our patients to do. Um, and, uh, I mean, Yoshi's picked a, uh, and now I understand why it's 20 grams uh, because of uh, the way alcohol is sold in Japan, um, but that's actually two standard drinks for us uh, for a week. We've cut it down to three standard drinks. Uh, based on when we do redo procedures, uh, how much damage we see within the atria. And until we cut it down below three drinks, we always found dramatic changes to the myocardium when we went back in. Unfortunately, we haven't quantified that to, to publish this yet. Um, but that, that's how we came up with three standard drinks in, in, in our series. So uh, I, I think it'll be important for us to come up with a number because patients respond better to having... A, a number of drinks that they could follow. And uh, I think Yoshi's suggestion is pretty reasonable for the J Japanese population. I was actually gonna add also, what do you think, uh, I think Yoshi, you mentioned this uh, during your talk. We talk about how we should be sort of abstaining after, like from the ablation, when you talk to the patient, yeah, we're gonna ablate you, let's get you to stop drinking and then let's see where you go. What do you think, how long do you think you should have them stop pre-ablation? Or do you think that makes a difference? How long? Uh, I think uh, uh, as long as I ever, as long as possible. <laughs> I don't I, I don't have a, 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 any uh, any answer to this uh, question. Um, but uh, uh, from my uh, experience of this study, uh, actually 20 gram of uh, uh, limitation is a a bit uh, uh, severe to many patients. So uh, in, in the group of 120 grams or more, uh, statistical significance was uh, clear. So I think uh, at least 120 grams uh, is uh, the cutoff. And if, it, if they can uh, complete stop, uh, of course, that's better. But I ask, ask patients 120 grams or more than 50%. This is a uh, practically reasonable, I think. And uh, many patients can uh, follow this uh, instruction, I hope, I think. So. I have a question about patients who uh, drink alcohol for years and then stop uh, completely. Do you think there's regression to a risk that's similar to the baseline population or are there, is there a cumulative toxic insult that leaves the heart uh, injured in a way uh, that is, is irreversible. Um, I was sort of intrigued, uh, Prash, by your talk about bringing people back to the lab and seeing the degree of fractionation or scar, or whatever you're referring to. Yeah. But has that been quantified? And do any of the panelists have comment on that? We, we studied that um, uh, using data from ERIC, the atherosclerosis mm -hmm. risk and community study, 
where we looked at those who abstained and precisely this question that also comes up frequently, specifically, once you've been drinking, you know, for years and years, is the cat out of the bag? Does it even matter if you stop? And I think that, um, you know, Alex and Peter Kistler's data and now these data suggest that there is some regression, that you are doing something. Uh, and we did find that the people who stopped drinking um, experienced the lowest risk of AFib. It, it was hard, it's hard to know how does that compare to what it would have been if they had never consumed alcohol, presumably uh, it's less. Um, but there is evidence for that. So, so one should not uh, give up hope just because they have a long history of drinking. It's a very optimistic message. I like that. Whether it's whether it's completely true or not is hard to know, but at least that's a, a motivating piece of information we can share with our patients. So Yoshi yes. mentioned. Oh, sorry. go ahead. Yes, so my, my question is, uh, yeah, both this study and also uh, uh, Peter Kistler's study um, takes a population that's consuming quite a large amount of alcohol um, and may not be representative of all the patients undergoing AF ablation, okay, but certainly we have them. Um, so uh, do you think we see the same sort of results with uh, lower alcohol consumption? Your paper suggests that, but what, what are your thoughts? Uh, thank you. So uh, I think uh, so. Uh, alcohol consum consumption uh, of 120 gram per week or more more than that. Uh, these patients uh, uh, definitely uh, benefit from alcohol reduction, and these patients is uh, one third of our patient cohort. It is quite a lot of patients, and uh, and uh, half of patients, 50% of patients are taking alcohol, but so 20% uh, of patients are taking alcohol, but uh, these patients, uh, be, uh, alcohol consumption is uh, zero gram to 120 grams. So they, they, these patients are moderate uh, alcohol drinkers. So I think um, these patients, um, I'm not sure that they will take, uh, take uh, they will benefit from alcohol reduction. No, I have a question along similar, similar lines. Um, you know, regarding the remarkable drop in, in, in alcohol consumption that you observed, <clears throat> that could be in part also related to the AFib ablation population where presumably those are more highly motivated, more symptomatic patients, and that may be more difficult to apply to the more general population. Um, what, what were your thoughts or, or what have your observations been uh, from that perspective? Thank you. So, uh, so these patients are, yeah, as they say, they are very motivated, and so they are very uh, keen to uh, cure AFib fibrillation. But some patients are very uh, per permanent AFib, are very low sent per persistent AFib. Uh, I, I discuss with the patient, and uh, to do ablation or uh, uh, just a rate control. And uh, we also discuss about alcohol consumption because alcohol increases uh, uh, bleeding risk as well. Not only uh, risk of uh, uh, AFib AF recurrence. And then this patient said, okay, I don't want to have ablation and I want to continue alcohol density. <laughs> so this is a uh, actual uh, real uh, clinical practice. So um, yeah, so alcohol reduction is, uh, very effective in uh, patients who are, uh, for, for example, highly educated people and uh, patients who are very uh, keen to cure AFib, AFib because uh, the, the fa their family already had a stroke or AFib. These patients are really keen to uh, uh, treatment of AFib. And also so the yeah. fact uh, that, they, that they underwent um, a pretty good sized uh, procedure for most of these people um, may serve as a, sort of a, a, a punctuation mark uh, for them such that, uh, you know, you've said, uh, if we're, we're doing this big procedure, this AFib ablation uh, for, these, for you in order to reduce uh, your risk of atrial fibrillation, now might be a good time to motivate you uh, as well to reduce your risk of alcohol. Um, whereas if an AFib ablation had not been performed, uh, there may not have been that punctuation mark, so to speak, 
uh, in order to potentiate the, uh, the doctor's advice to reduce their dose of alcohol. So Yoshi, um, in addition to alcohol, what other lifestyle counseling did you provide? And maybe I could ask the panelists, uh, when your patients come in and you're giving them all this counseling, I'm sure you hear, could you just prioritize for me on what's the top of your list? What lifestyle modification do you want me to make the most? That's what I'll work on. What advice do you give them? So, uh, I, you know, yeah, uh, I ask a, a patient uh, uh, they, if they uh, uh, take alcohol, and uh, half of patients are taking alcohol, and uh, and one third of patients are, t are taking a lot of alcohol. So they, I, I ask uh, advice to reduce uh, alcohol before ablation. And uh, but in Japan, uh, uh, and uh, if patients uh, uh, had a is obese. And I ask uh, uh, some exercise or diet, but uh, a number of obese patients are not not that uh, big in Japan. Uh, so BMI greater than 27 is about 15% in my uh, clinical practice. So uh, that's why I focused on uh, alcohol consumption. I read the Brush Sanders lab uh, study and uh, they uh, investigated uh, B obese patients with a BMI of greater than 27. I checked my uh, patient's uh, patient data, and then BMI 27 is uh, only 15% or 10% on, on my, in my lab. So, uh, but I look for uh, some other risk factors in Japanese patients, and I found maybe uh, alcohol uh, has a great impact on the uh, patient in Japan, and I don't know in the US or the Australia, and uh, I did, that's why I did this study. I think, Ed, can I add, add, add to that answer? I think the um, uh, this is an important area for shared decision making with the patient. Um, and so we've tended to get people to keep diaries of their exercise, their blood pressures, their, uh, their diet, their alcohol history. Uh, and they bring that into each visit. And we then work with them to come up with uh, what they want to reduce. We kind of have some suggestions and work with them to come up with it. Much more likely they're going to follow that rather than us instructing them what they're going to do. The main thing that we need to do is to make it achievable. If they don't, if they can't achieve uh, the target we set them, they turn off, and and that's when you lose the uh, motivation to change. So it has to be an achievable target. Uh, and that's where we we probably have more of an influence than actually dictating what they uh, do. At Mayo Clinic, I've, I've tried to get patients into uh, cardiac rehab because once they're in cardiac rehab, they have connection with nutritionists, they have structured exercise, they have benchmarks and goals to meet, and uh, our post-MI patients do very well in that program. And it feels like we're missing an opportunity to get these patients uh, who are motivated and, and are at an inflection point in their care, just like a post-MI patient, to engage in those activities. Unfortunately, uh, there's no reimbursement for cardiac rehab after catheter ablation in the U.S., so it's an uphill battle. It's something that we've had a lot of trouble with. It may be something that as a society, um, we may want to, as a professional society, we may want to advocate for because clearly uh, your work and others have shown that we can make a big difference in these patients' lives at low cost by motivating behavior change. And I think that's really the, the missing link for a lot of us. And we've done, we've done so much work to build this infrastructure and it's, it's, it's unused for this population. I was gonna say, and uh, I work primarily at the Veterans Hospital. And so in, in some ways we're lucky, right? Uh, because we can um, do what Prash has done and we've instituted this sort of heart health clinic that we do send our post MIs uh, to that or any ACSs to that clinic, and they do get hooked into cardiac rehab and nutrition and exercise and, you know, diabetes. We hook them up with integrative care, et cetera. And so now, um, in our own EP group, we've sent our ablation patients or AF patients to that same heart health clinic, and we're starting that sort of branch. And I think the important part of that really is to integrate taking a really good alcohol history, because I think people sort of gloss over it a little bit and say, well, how much do you drink? And you sort of say, oh yeah, you drink, okay, cut down. But I think to Yoshi's point, I think having that number is super important and in integrating that into that heart health clinic. 
think the story we're, we're in this major uh, kind of period of transition, I think, where thanks to the work of, of the you know people on the call and many others, the recognition that lifestyle actually matters when it comes to arrhythmias is finally coming to the forefront, but I think it's still new. Um, just the idea that one can prevent an arrhythmia, that lifestyle affects it, uh, that, that alcohol is not necessarily heart healthy. I think that's another source of, of uphill battles we're all fighting, um, and which is precisely why this sort of research is so important. And I think the next phase is going to be a lot of the things we're kind of speculating about, about, and Prash has some, some, some good, you know, direct experience understanding, well, what are the different strategies that actually work to, for behavior change in this particular group? And then hopefully we can, I, I completely agree with you, Peter, same exact uh, experience with um, this frustration that there's this infrastructure there would seem to be perfect, but we can't um, get insurance to cover it. And so hopefully we can push things that way. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Prash. No, no problem. Look, I wanted to comment on the cardiac rehabilitation. It really depends on each site uh, as to how the standardization of what's being delivered is, uh, is provided. And one of the things that we've noticed in our coronary artery disease uh, patients who are seeing uh, in those clinics is weight loss is not what a big feature of the cardiac rehab programs. And that's such an intensive component of uh, the AF program uh, that we've had to kind of manage that a little bit more directly. They're very good at up titrating of medication. They're very good at lipid management. They're good at promoting exercise and smoking cessation. I'm, I'm not sure alcohol is focused on and definitely weight isn't quite so well focused on. So we may need to expand the cardiac rehab programs a little bit more from the arrhythmia perspective. It seems like any tools that we can use for behavioral modification are appealing. And I, I wondered if maybe Janet or Greg could talk about how uh, useful you think digital apps would be in our older AF population. I think we have the right population in the veteran, uh, in our veteran population because our average age is 75 and above, right? Um, and People are surprisingly, you know, I think a lot of people are surprised that our older veterans actually really love it um, using some of these digital apps. Uh, we have a really easy one that's called the Annie app, and it comes on like even those old flip phones. And you can get a very easy text message that sort of just says easy stuff like, did you take your blood pressure medication today, right? Or did, is your blood pressure today greater than 140 over 80? Um, so I think you can institute these sorts of things. And I think Yoshi was talking about how he has an app that he's testing out. So I'd love to hear more about that and more from Greg as well. But older patients, they can do it. I think we shouldn't write them off for sure. Yeah, I, I would say it's a common um, view that, well, older patients, they're not going to have a smartphone or they're not going to be capable of engaging with, you know, fancy technology. But I think smartphones are so ubiquitous, even among uh, the elderly, uh, and a good app, frankly, you know, a lot of the, the best technology, um, its implementation relies on psychology and user uh, experience and, you know, really the design. Uh, and if it's designed well, it should be simple to use. That's what makes it a good, a useful app. Uh, that all being said, um, I think sometimes we rush a little bit to believe that you know, a fancy gadget must be good. And so we want to apply the same rigor that we would to anything else in terms of, you know, really evaluating it in a scientific way. And no doubt some apps are going to be better than others, but it's definitely a rich area for research is trying to figure out how can we utilize these tools that we, most of us carry around in our pockets to actually imp help implement behavior change. And then also to be flexible. I mean, you know, in, in our studies, we often that are uh, app or remote or technology based will often have a parallel experience um, for those without smartphones uh, where they can interact on their desktop or laptop via email. And I would say obviously, you know, uh, in terms of just um, generalizability, that's, that's the great, great, great majority of even the elderly population does have, thankfully, you know, access to the internet. 
Another question has come in through the Q&A about uh, whether uh, drinking leads to other high-risk behaviors. And it reminds me of the patient who says, well, I only drink when I, I only smoke when I drink. And you say, well, when do you drink? And they say, well, every, every night. So, um, but it, it, do you find that these uh, behaviors are correlated? Uh, I suppose that's the question. I think the answer is probably yes, but. So I can take a stab at that. I mean, I will say this is a common question uh, we get from skeptical reviewers, like, well, how do you know they're not smoking? But I, I will say, having done a few uh, studies related to smoking and trying to try to recruit, uh, at least in the Bay Area, um, where maybe smoking isn't as prevalent, although it's still uh, quite prevalent, um, it's hard to find an AFib patient that also is uh, actively smoking. I mean, they're definitely around, but whereas AFib patients that are consuming al alcohol is that's extremely that seems to be uh, more commonly the case uh, than not but it is worth emphasizing that smoking is also clearly an, an a, a established independent risk factor for afib that we all need to be uh, aware of another question i have is there's this idea maybe at least in the cardiac literature that red wine is somewhat protective or maybe wine is better than others but if alcohol itself is a toxin why does it matter if it's wrapped in a you know california cab versus a you know a, a, a gas station you know grain alcohol or something why did why, why does that matter or does it matter or what's the evidence that it matters how you take your alcohol And let me take a stab at that. I think for secondary prevention, I don't, I don't think we have any data to say one's better than the other. And I, yeah, actually all alcohol should be considered the same. And it's really this intriguing data in the primary prevention area that maybe there's a difference and perhaps that's different in terms of other vascular risks that contribute as well. So uh, I think that's slightly different from that perspective. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there are constituents that may have other effects. Perhaps, you know, there's a, this notion that red wine may be more anti-inflammatory, for example, some other forms of alcohol may have more calories. Interestingly, when you look at the data related to cardio protection, and that is really constrained to the coronary disease and MI world, um, even though there's this common belief that it's really a red wine thing, it's really in populations that drink, that don't binge drink, that drink in moderation and regularly, that U-shaped curve you see where the lowest risk of the coronary disease MI occurs at the lowest levels of, of alcohol consumption is fairly um, even regardless of the type of alcohol. So I think some of that is related to press, you know, uh, whether it's companies, you know, working on resveratrol, which is this, you know, purported protective component of, of red wine. I don't know, but the, the alcohol or the, the data doesn't really back that up with the exception of, again, Chris Wong's uh, paper from Prash's group, where the one, the one type and amount of alcohol drank that was found to be associated with a lower risk of AFib did seem to be spe quite specifically in red wine, as was appropriately acknowledged by those authors. Hard to know if that that could also reflect some confounding. What, you know, what else are the red wine drinkers doing that the beer and spirits drinkers aren't doing, uh, for example? Yeah, it really seems like that piece of the J curve, the people who have one drink with dinner per night, th that's a marker of so many things. I mean, it means probably your day has a structure where you're employed, where you're insured, where you have somebody to eat with, where you have company and social interaction, you know, it's a, it's a marker of a of a of a lifestyle that I think supports good health. Um, whether or not the alcohol itself in in that dose is actually protective, I think, is a key question, um, and one that I think would be really nice to know. But and I think it's hard to, it's hard to get at that epidemiologically because it's so uh, intensely confounded by the way our society is built and the way we live. But. You know, I want to make a, make a comment about the associated uh, risk factors. So one of the things we've seen uh, with sleep apnea, for example, is that there is such daily variations uh, very closely linked to alcohol consumption. So if someone's drinking a lot, they're more likely to have an obstructive episode that night 
uh, compared to a, another night when they're exercised and they're well hydrated. Uh, and, and so there is, a, you know, it may not be a direct correlation, but there may be a prov provocation of other risk factors as well with alcohol. Uh, and I don't think we've appreciated that quite so well. Yeah, just, just to add on to that, you know, there's also growing evidence that perhaps even independent of sleep apnea, that simply sleep disruption uh, heightens the risk for AFib. And we know that alcohol can disrupt sleep. And it's important to, to, to clarify that, you know, this doesn't mean that it's not the alcohol causing the AFib. That would be one mechanism via which alcohol uh, would lead to AFib. The, the other thing I, I was just going to add, um, it was, uh, just in terms of counseling patients regarding lifestyle, that is a bit of good news, at least for now, is in regards to coffee. So I've, um, you know, been <laughs> happy to be able to tell my patients, yeah, sorry, you know, you shouldn't really be, be drinking alcohol, but um, it's probably okay to, to consume coffee. And, of course, everything in moderation, not in excess. And I'm not, I don't recommend people begin drinking coffee if they weren't doing it otherwise. But for people that would enjoy it, um, I've been, it's, it's surprising how consistently they've been told, stop drinking coffee because you have AFib, um, despite any evidence really to demonstrate that. And so that's been a little bit of a bright spot. And, uh, you know, anecdotally, um, I can say patients don't seem to, experience a higher risk of AFib. I've even had a couple, again, complete anecdotes where it seems like their, you know, their AFib burden does go down, but that's another uh, rich area for, for research. Greg, can I get you to expand a little bit more on some of your work where you've uh, actually looked at objective measures uh of uh, alcohol consumption. I mean, I, I actually don't know how you manage to put ankle bracelets on people uh, in, in San Francisco. I mean, that's quite dramatic, huh? But, uh, you, you know, is there an opportunity for us to bring some of these tools into the clinic? Um, probably not the ankle bracelet, but uh, appreciate your views. Sure, yeah, no, I think this is a place where smartwatches may be useful where, or self-monitoring devices and this idea of N of 1 studies, for example, especially if we consider the possibility that some of these triggers may be idiosyncratic. Uh, this is related to this trial we recently completed. I'm presenting at AHA called the I Stop AFib trial, where individuals could actually receive feedback regarding their experience after being uh, randomly assigned to go ahead and, you know, expose yourself to your lifestyle factor versus avoid it uh, while recording their AFib uh, and then receiving feedback about that. And I think, you know, this circles back to the question of how can these apps be useful? Of course, that all presupposes they're already uh, motivated. Um, it is, I, I agree that, you know, strapping the ankle uh, devices on it wasn't easy. We had to put a UCSF cardiology sticker on uh, those devices so people didn't, you know, think <laughs> didn't didn't have the stigma that could be associated with those devices. But again, I think transforming these these observations we're making into behavior change, that's going to be an important next phase uh, for all of us. Well, we're getting towards the end. It looks like there's one more question in the Q&A about is alcohol heart healthy? Maybe we just want to end the night uh, with each of the panelists making one statement that we could sort of take off. <laughs> Um, what's the bottom line when your patient asks you this question? How are you answering it today? Greg, do you want to start and then maybe Prash and then Jane? Sure. So I think, I mean, the thing that we can be very, I think, comfortably confident of uh, is that drinking in excess, and I, I generally say certainly more than two drinks in 24 hours is harmful, even when it comes to coronary disease and MIs. And that's been We've published on that. Others have demonstrated that. So there's really no question there. And so the, the uncertainty lies around this, you know, one drink a day sort of thing uh, at the most. And the honest answer is we don't know. But my suspicion is, and this is what I share with my patients, that there are differences among different people. 
And if you have someone who has a fib, that's someone who's, um, to the best of our knowledge, declared themselves as someone who may experience more harm with alcohol. And so I, you know, I, I don't want to be naive about it, and I want to, you know, I, I treat the whole patient. And so I do acknowledge the quality of life issues um, and the uncertainties. But the way I tend to frame it is, if you want to do everything that you can to avoid a uh, fib, minimizing alcohol as much as you can or avoiding it is probably the best thing. Separately, there there is this uh, question that has come up. Uh, we are working on trying to. Um, get funding to do a major randomized prospective study to try to answer some of these questions, but um, it's going to be, you know, it'll take some resources to do that. We still don't know. There's a lot of unknowns, to be honest. I think my, my approach is very similar to what Greg has uh, outlined. I think it really depends on the person as to how much we should be uh, gearing them. And in the AF population, they're an at-risk population. We've, we've set, as I've said, the limit to three standard drinks. Uh, we depends again on whether we start with that or end with that. Uh, it depends on how much someone is uh, consuming to start with as to what we set as limits for them as they progress. The aim is to get down to three standard drinks a week. We try to say it's either together or spread apart and we give that kind of choice to the person um, and that tends to be something they tend to tolerate a little bit better in terms of advice rather than saying absolutely nothing. So that's, that's how we've done that. Yeah, I would agree with what everyone said. I think the hardest part for us sometimes is if someone's drinking quite a lot, sometimes the first step is just to say, just cut back some, right? Because I think to get them down to two or three is really rough. So again, small baby steps as Prash has said, but we do try to get them down to a couple uh, a week at the very most. And the way that I sort of phrase it is in my AFib patients, there are things that you can control and there's things that maybe are harder to control. And maybe this is one of the things that maybe you can make a dent in by making choices that we can help you with. Right, I think that's all very good advice. It looks like we're at the top of the hour. So I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Yoshi in particular for conducting that great study, sharing it with us tonight. And then our great group of panelists for uh, bringing your insights tonight and I think uh, continuing a very provocative and valuable conversation. So yeah, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.